We're on the north shore of Oahu in Hawaii, and behind me is Waimea Bay. The bay is now the most famous big wave spot in the world. But in early 1957, Waimea had yet to be surfed. Later that year, Greg Knoll, a rowdy 20-year-old surfer filmmaker visiting from Manhattan Beach, paddled out here with a couple of his friends on a medium-sized day. They were the first. The really big days at the bay came later that season, and Noel was also there with his surfboard and his camera. Back in California, Noel took his new Search for Surf movie up and down the coast. Waimea was the highlight. The Grammys sat back in their seats, watched, and began to sweat. Hello, I'm Robert Weaver, and this is the Surfer's Journal. Greg Knoll grew up in Manhattan Beach, California. While still in elementary school, he got a job at the bait shop on the end of the municipal pier, where he watched the surfers riding below. In 1949, when Knoll was 11, he bought a redwood board for $15, a 110-pound slab that he was barely able to drag to the shore break. By the time he reached high school, Knoll had decided he was going to make a living somehow through surfing. He was already selling his own brand of surfboards, and in 1960 and 61, he published a series of surf cartoon magazines. By the mid-60s, Greg Knoll Surfboards was among the biggest factory retail operations in California. Knoll himself had become perhaps the most famous big wave surfer of all time, instantly recognizable in his black and white jailhouse trunks. He was called the Bull for charging into some of the most dangerous big waves imaginable. Noel made surf movies from 1956 to 1961, although films ranked third on his list of priorities after surfing and board building. He didn't produce great cinematic art, but he probably had a better time putting his movies together than anyone else. Bud Brown was the first to make commercial surf films. Greg Noel was second, or that is, Greg and his wife Beverly. Beverly shot the big days in Hawaii while Greg surfed. Noel got his first camera, a Bell & Howell, from ski movie maker Warren Miller, and he took it with him to Australia in 1956. Later that year, he combined the footage from Australia with that from Hawaii and California, and he came up with his first surf movie. He called it Search for Surf, and he liked the title so much that he used it for his next five films. At that time of my life, I was so stoked on surfing that I just wanted to make a living any way I could. I mean, if, it, if, if there was a buck and going out and waxing up boards for guys, I would have probably done it, you know. I, uh, I wanted to shape boards, I wanted to make movies, I wanted to do anything and be a part of surfing in any way that I could. It was, uh, it was an ongoing process all the time. I mean, everywhere I went, I took a camera, and if I wasn't surfing, uh, I was shooting film, and if I was surfing, I would many times uh, recruit somebody on the beach that uh, had a little experience and uh, um, just tried to keep the camera going as much as uh, I could afford to feed it film, which in those days uh, wasn't a whole lot. The first Search for Surf movie cost about $3,000 to make, and the versions that followed didn't cost much more. In the spring and summer, Noel did live narration showings, mainly in Southern California. By the end of the 50s, Noel, along with Bud Brown, Bruce Brown, and John Severson, were part of a small and sometimes competitive group of surf film makers. Uh, humorous co competition, friendly competition, because these guys are the guys that you're around, you're surfing with, they're your buddies. And for Bruce Brown and me, who, you know, the year before he started in a film, we were in Mexico together and I was filming him, calling him a camera hog. Bud was always kind of... Uh, the most enjoyable to heckle because he took it pretty serious and you know even if we weren't going to film the guys it'd be kind of neat just to to you know if you'd catch him doing this to pull over the car and grab the camera equipment and, and, and set it up you know, just to watch his butt pucker you know. Peter Cole, a big wave surfer for nearly 40 years, remembers one of the reasons Noel stood out from the other filmmakers. Greg shot the best sunset footage, without a doubt, and he had some really good footage, 
and he was focusing on a lot of the stuff that I was interested in. I'd say in the late 50s, he was, he was spending a lot of time shooting and not surfing. Bud was shooting more of the Makaha, and Greg was shooting a lot of the North Shore. Then Greg kind of phased out of the shooting, and, and then he was in the lineup, and we got a lot less big waves, let me tell you. Noel's surfboard business was growing. In 1956, just after graduating from high school, Noel was making about 10 hand-shaped balsa boards a week out of his garage. One year later, he and Beverly, now newlyweds, opened their first retail surfboard shop. The first Search for Surf movie was produced that year as well, and Noel wasn't shy about flogging his product on screen. His surfboard company grew steadily, in 1965, Noel opened a 20,000 square foot surfboard factory in Hermosa Beach and was soon producing up to 200 boards a week. Some of the best big wave surfers in the world were riding Greg Noel surfboards, including Ricky Gregg, Peter Cole, Fred Hemmings, and Jose Angel. In 1966, Noel convinced Malibu's Black Knight, Mickey Dora, to produce a special signature model called Decat. The ad campaign that followed included this controversial image of Dora. Greg Knoll wasn't exactly a student of filmmaking. In the late 50s, after he'd already made two or three movies, Knoll was shooting side by side in Hawaii with Bruce Brown one afternoon. Bruce looked over and asked Greg, what f-stop are you using? Greg wasn't sure. As a matter of fact, Greg says he didn't even know what an f-stop was. But if Noel wasn't creating great art, he was doing a better job than anyone else, Brown included, at capturing what it was really like to be a surfer in the late 50s. From the 1920s until the late 1960s, Malibu was surfing's premier design center and test track. Noel still remembers visiting the famous point break for the first time in 1949. I went with Dale Valsey and uh, I was just totally blown away by these perfect machine waves, offshore wind, and then to boot, here was Matt Kivlin and Joe Quigg and Dave Rockland doing things that I'd never seen done before. But when Noel brought his camera to the beach beginning in 1956, he didn't focus so much on design advancements as he did on the characters Malibu attracted. When surfing shot up in popularity in the late 50s and early 60s, there was a push from within to clean up the sport. One magazine wrote about the surfing problem and suggested that nonconformists should have their boards taken away until they became better citizens. Another magazine published a four-point loyalty oath titled The Surfer's Creed. Greg Knoll, meanwhile, with his Search for Surf movies, thumbed his nose at surfing's new voices of moderation. 
The surfers in his films were young and rowdy, occasional lawbreakers, and full-time pranksters. sea crew always went a little further than anybody else, as was the case when the local surfers, dressed in Nazi uniforms, entered a storm drain on their flexi flyers. The end of the line was marked by swastika flags. I think people viewed surfers so differently that they in turn picked up on the thing and made a game out of it. I mean, like, you know, I hear about the, you know, like the Nazi thing and the, and the, uh, and the swastikas. Well, when we were kids, uh, there was a lot of that going on, and there was never any connection between, you know, the atrocities that were done in Germany in the war uh, with the swastika. We just knew that if we painted a swastika on something, it'd piss people off. So what do you do? You paint two of them, and then piss them off more, you know? Like, all we were doing is just farting around, dressing goofy, and spending our time in the water and having a bitchin' time watching everybody get all excited about what we were doing. Greg Knoll's interest in big waves took a giant step forward in the fall of 1954 when he was 17 years old and moved to Hawaii just before his junior year of high school. Two years later, Knoll met Henry Priest, who was living in a homemade shack on the beach at Haleiwa on Oahu's North Shore. By that time, Knoll's interest in big surf was fast becoming an obsession. And he was kind of watching the waves at sunset, but most of all, he was watching the waves at Waimea, you know. So I, I, I honestly believe that Greg was the man that got the place started at Waimea. Nobody knows for sure who actually rode the first wave at Waimea in 1957, but everyone agrees it was Greg Knoll who led the charge. By the end of the following season, there were no shortage of surfers who were willing to throw themselves over the ledge at Waimea. developed a kind of forward driving sumo stance for riding big waves. Not pretty, but effective. At six foot two, 230 pounds, it was hard to knock Greg Knoll off his surfboard. In late 64, Knoll and his friend Mike Stang decided to surf the outside reef at Pipeline. Photographer John Severson took this shot of Knoll on the beach as they waited for a break in the surf. We'd hit the, hit the water and the current was sucking us as fast as you could run uh, towards sunset. And we timed it so we hit a little saddle there and got out. And then it was a process of about four hours to get the line up. We'd paddle out. These waves would be breaking maybe once an hour. Uh, I got one wave there which uh, Bud, Bud Brown uh, recorded. Uh, and it was a very unusual ride. I was scared. And this particular wave as it hit the reef and wrapped, 
the thing not only did it start start getting hollower, but it started increasing in size. And uh, it just got hollower and bigger, and I was locked in. I couldn't get out of the deal. I could hear the board chattering like a water ski at high speed, and I could hear this thing across the water, and then pretty soon it was less chatter and less chatter. And I looked down, I was spread out on the board, and I was actually rising off the water, and I was just coming off the face of the wave and riding air. And then, of course, Greg Knoll has never been media shy. Beginning in 1956, a good part of Knoll's career in surfing was photographed, written about, and printed in his own movies, in other people's movies, and in books and magazines. But in the late 60s, the spotlight had moved on to the next generation of surfers. And by December 1969, when Greg Knoll rode the biggest wave of his life, not a single photograph marked the event. Other changes were taking place. Noel was raising children, his surfboard business was in decline, and many of his old surfing friends had left the sport. Even the lineup at Makaha had shifted in never before seen ways, as Noel, 32 years old, paddled out by himself, way, way outside, for his last and heaviest big wave experience. And I finally, at one point, I had to just, uh, I let a few sets go by and I had to paddle off to the side and I said, uh, you know, uh, what do I want to do here? You know, what's the idea? You know, you want to give up the whole show for uh, a wave? Is this kind of stupid or what? And then, then I thought, well, if I don't do this, I'll be 80 years old, sitting there banging my cane on the ground that I was a chicken. And I let the wave that I'd worked all my life for go by. So I really didn't have a choice. And I paddled back into the lineup, and one of the big sets come, and I just went down the thing, and that was that was it. I mean, like once the decision was made, the rest was mechanical, and it just it happened. I mean, Buffalo Kealana, Makaha's best-known surfer and Noel's longtime friend, saw the giant wave. Noel finally rode that day, and we watched him catch this big wave, you know. And uh, as he was coming down, as he was coming down, the waves was just getting bigger and bigger. And he was still going down, going down, and when he, when, by the time he reached down the bottom, the wave was halfway coming down on him already. And by the time he uh, would thrown out, the thing would just scoop him and roll him and bound the hell out of him, you know. But uh, wow, yeah, wow, that was, that was heavy. Not only was it the last giant wave of Noel's career, it was an obvious place, as he saw it, to step down from a long, colorful, and rewarding life as a full-time surfer. When I started out, it was just, you know, the little beach rat and having a great time on my uh, redwood board because uh, it was so hard to ride. Uh, you finally got to, you could stand up, and then the balls would come in, and it was all fun and everything. But there was a period of time when it got into the big wave riding. I don't know when it was, but it just kind of like took over for a whole bunch of years, maybe, maybe 10, years or so and it just got real intense about if you rode a certain size wave that you wanted to ride a little bigger wave a little bit that's the, the whole everything changed and the goal was to ride a bigger wave and I surfed sunset basically to keep keep in shape to kind of hone your skills for the days that Waimea Bay broke. I mean there was a time where I was so uh, cocky and so uh, mentally and physically geared for what I was doing, I didn't think there was, uh, I'm going, you know, come on, God, give me a wave that I can't ride, you know. I mean, it was like, I, I honestly felt I was indestructible and that I could ride anything that it could produce. And then, uh, uh, then Makaha occurred, and uh, fortunately in life, there are these humbling experiences that turn you around. And, uh, you know, and I realize that there are certainly uh, waves that uh, are, can do you in, for sure. In terms of my deal, it was like riding a wave that was like 10 foot bigger than anything I had ever ridden before. It was just a quantum leap. And that morning when I woke up, I was like, I'm going to surf for the rest of my life. I am absolutely stoked. Uh, my whole life, you know, centered around surfing. That night when I went to bed, it was like, it was with a different feeling that I'd uh, done something that I didn't have to do anymore, you know.
Greg Knoll and his family moved to Crescent City near the California-Oregon border in the early 70s, where Knoll worked for 18 years as a commercial fisherman. He no longer surfs, but his ties to the sport remain strong. In 1989, he published an autobiography. In 1992, he released a Search for Surf compilation on video. He stayed in touch with surfers over the years. Today, Noel makes replica wood surfboards that trace design developments in the sport all the way back to ancient Hawaii. He's the only person this century to shape an Olo board, the type of surfboard used exclusively by Hawaiian royalty for hundreds of years. All my life, basically, I've been doing things involved in surfing, and the irony of the whole thing is, I started in a, in a double car garage, I'm 59 now, and I'm back in a double car garage, right, come full circle.